This is something that I've, we have been uh, doing for the last, last one year. The results that I'm going to present here is for this machine, because uh, that is, this is the only machine that we can think of now, where we can actually extract uh, both PDFs as well as fragmentation functions. Uh, so this is briefly the you know, plan of my talk. Okay, so why I'm interested in DIS, okay, we had learned quite a lot from uh, deep inelastic scattering experiment, okay, where we actually only probe uh, the incoming uh, proton and uh, we understand, you know, how, uh, you know, longitudinal momentum is distributed and probably we'll know more about how transverse momentum is distributed, how spins of the proton is shared by, you know, its constituents and so on and so forth from this tip, you know, Tip inelastic experiment. Semi inclusive, of course, comes with an additional information. Namely, it contains, in addition to PDFs, it also contains information about fragmentation functions and EAC or uh, compass or whatever. These machines are capable of actually extracting these um, fragmentation functions. Okay, so unlike uh, DIS, semi inclusive DIS comes with two unknown functions which carry information about the incoming proton and Hadronization, you know, uh, mechanism through this fragmentation function, okay, which goes by the name pattern fragmentation function. Okay, so semi-inclusive deep inelastic scattering, of course, helps to understand these two non-perturbative quantities, provided we have a nice framework to actually extract them, given the data. Okay, uh, so we know that perturbative QCD has been working very well. And uh, we have uh, um, many uh, tests of this QCD, uh, both at uh, deep inelastic scattering experiments, E plus, E minus, and also in the LHC physics. Okay. Of course, you know, uh, this framework comes with several uh, caveats. Namely, you know, there are some non perturbative inputs that we cannot actually calculate them uh, satisfactorily within the theory. So they are actually, we call theoretical uncertainty. There's also uncertainty coming from strong coupling constant, masses, and so on and so forth, okay? The only way to resolve these problems is to actually to go beyond leading order predictions, okay? If you calculate sufficiently a higher order in perturbation theory, we would expect that the results that we get are, um, you know, stable with respect to any of the variations that you see. Okay, so they are more reliable in some sense. Okay, so the semi-inclusive DIS is one process that actually I noticed that it has not received much attention in the literature, in particular in the context of calculating them precisely. Okay, the first calculation as you can, as you can see is by Altarelli, Ellis, Martinelli and Pai, which was done way before 1930. 79, okay, this is very, very long ago, actually. This was the first computation, analog computation. This was computed along with other processes, okay, as an academic exercise at that point when QCT was at the very infant stage and people were actually learning how to compute anything beyond leading order, actually. So that this computation was more like an exercise by these people, actually, okay. And it is an honest to good computation and it is, it was actually at this stage, NLO level, for almost four decades, I would say, okay? Until 2022, Fogelsang and company actually came up with, uh, you know, one step uh, from, uh, from NLO computations. They compute what they called actually surplus virtual part. This part, you know, it's not that a computation, it's actually extracting it from some universal um, you know, resumed results, okay? Because there is some universality between Trillian process and then the semi-inclusive DIS. And the soft physics is well understood in, the, you know, in, in, semi in the Trillian process. So using that knowledge, one can actually extract soft plus virtual part, which I will explain to you what it means in 2022, which is much, much, later actually. So this was the, you know, uh, I would say latest computation. So the, so the predictions were not known for a very long time for reasons that it's obvious because there are no experiments which actually were 
really trying to probe this, uh, you know, uh, fragmentation functions and PDFs in such, uh, you know, such experimental environment. So now that there's, there's a need to compute them, okay, because EIC is coming up and there's more uh, reasons to, uh, you know, uh, compute this. It's not only for, you know, EIC purpose. Of course, if you really want to use any of this formula, we need to have a precise prediction. Otherwise, you know, they, they, they are sensitive to those scales. Let me about TIS. TIS, of course, is very well known, actually. Now everyone knows about it very well. Okay, it is controlled by two structure functions, Ws, and these structure functions are actually well measured, uh, you know, both at ERA and then later uh, at various other experiments. Okay, so these functions actually carry quite a lot of information about uh, how, um, you know, the partons share proton momentum, you know, in which way they share and so on and so forth. All these things is well understood. Okay, semi-inclusive DIS. Uh, as you can see, again, like DIS, factorizes into leptonic and hadronic part. And the hadronic part also very, very surprisingly, depends again only of two structure functions, F1 and F2, if you only restrict yourselves to polarized environment, unpolarized environment. That means you sum up all the polarizations. In the collinear picture, I mean, you can see that there are only two F1, structure functions, F1 and F2 very, very similar to the structure functions that we see in DIS, okay? But the only difference between the DIS structure functions and semi-inclusive structure function is, is appearance of an additional, you know, scaling parameter called Z, which actually carries information about how parton in the final state fragments into hadron, okay? So the, there are two scales here, you know, scaling variables. One that corresponds to the, you know, momentum fraction associated with the incoming pattern participating in the you know, scattering. And the other one, which is related to the you know, pattern that fragments into hadron. Okay, there are two scaling variables. This is just uh, you know, same as what I said, actually. Okay, these are the structure functions which are not calculable. They contain an additional information through a scaling variable Z. Okay. And of course, you know, this parameterization is actually respected by, you know, various Lorentz invariants, parity, time reversal, and so on and so forth. Okay, while well, it is not calculable in a QCD or any particular theory, you can actually parameterize them in terms of, uh, you know, PDFs, like we do deep inelastic scattering, we parameterize in terms of PDFs, which, uh, you know, which is just talks about how ith pattern shares the momentum of the proton, okay? In the case of semi-inclusive DIS, that's a pattern model is slightly, you know, modified. The way it is modified is by the introduction of this new additional piece. This piece contains what is called the fragmentation functions. This is very well understood, okay? We have measured them as precisely as possible, okay, from various uh, inelastic experiments. Okay, and this is the one which actually not well understood, well measured, well extracted. Okay, and that's this, the, you know, one which parameterizes this, in, you know, outgoing pattern. And this part is calculable in, in, in if you use pattern model. Okay, of course, if you, you improve this by QCD, then it's calculable in perturbation theory, in power series expansion and strong coupling constant. So this is the only part that you can calculate if you want to actually uh, make a prediction for F1, provided these Fs and Ds are known. Okay, this is just, you know, some statements about what these individual pieces that I explained just now. And the kinematics of this process would look something like this. Okay, you have um, hadronic variables. As I said, in the last two scaling variables are the one which are very important in my uh, talk. One is actually the Bjorken variable, which it talks about, you know, incoming pattern. And then there's a variable called Z, which talks about the fragmenting uh, pattern, okay? And these two variables are related to the variable, you know, corresponding variables and the pattern model level through these two relations, actually. X prime is related to X by X1. Z prime is related to Z by Z1, actually. So both of them are somehow connected to the momentum fractions carried away by incoming pattern and the hadron from the 
final state part. So that's how it looks like. So if I want to really calculate, um, let's say, you know, higher order corrections to this uh, scattering processes, all I need to do is actually I need to compute pattern level cross. This is the only thing that you can compute in QCD, okay? Of course, these PDFs and uh, fragmentation functions are actually extracted from the experiments, okay? So there are probably methods to compute, but they are very difficult to compute using other methods. So this is the formula that we use to extract uh, this, uh, the fragmentation contributions. Uh, the processes would look something like this. You have an incoming part on A, scattering of the photon, virtual photon, producing B, B fragments into hadron, plus junk of other particles that we sum up, okay? Because you have two structure functions for you know, calculation, F1 and F2, you need to actually um, use two projectors to project out because they are all proportional to some tensors that appear, okay? Typically, um, uh, you have list of processes, okay? Uh, these are the basic pattern level processes that we need to uh, worry about, okay? And uh, incoming states, you know, like uh, quarks, anti-quarks, different flavors, gluons, all of them will be actually parametrized in terms of these PDFs, okay? And the final state patterns, okay? Q here, Q and G here, and so on and so forth. One of them will fragment into hadron. So each one of them will carry a fragmentation function, squat fragmenting into hadron, gluon fragmenting into hadron, antiquark fragmenting into hadron, and so on and so forth. So if you want to calculate an, uh, you know, hadron level cross sections, I need to take into account all the initial state PDFs appropriately convoluted with final state fragmentation functions. So even though I've listed only a few of them, okay, when you write down the formula, you get many, many contributions, and we need to take into account all the, you know, cal, you know uh, uh, results that are coming from these Feynman diagrams. So at NNLO level that we are actually uh, trying to calculate in this you know, work, okay, we encounter uh, three distinct type of processes. One, containing pure virtual you know, diagrams, okay. I've given a sample diagram of this kind where, you know, gluons are exchanged between initial and final states. And there are also pure, um, it's not via, it's a, you know, real virtual diagrams where you have emission as well as a typo, and you have a virtual and real, and then pure real emissions axioms. I've given a sample diagrams. It's not that there are only two diagrams that we need to calculate. There are a few hundred diagrams that we need to calculate, and all of them are calculable, actually. These are also examples where, you know, incoming states are gluons, and final states could be quarks and gluons, okay? These are the typical diagrams, and um, we need to calculate them. Of course, this cannot be simply written down on a sheet of paper and calculates. So we have now very nice, um, you know, tools to actually uh, get, uh, you know, in some form, and then later on we'll have to play with it, actually. So there is some uh, nice uh, program called QGraph, which generates all the Feynman diagrams, large number of hundreds of thousands of Feynman diagrams can be generated using this, okay? And these diagrams can be actually processed through uh, uh, nice programs, uh, which deals with, uh, you know, uh, tracing gamma matrices of, you know, 12 matrices or 16 matrices and so on and so forth. And you can also perform on color algebra because QCD comes with lots of color uh, factors. We need to actually uh, handle them because this is at NNLO level, as you can see, the complexity is very uh, high. So it's, you need to actually handle all of them in a very systematic way. And it, such, such computations come with, uh, you know, this infrared divergence in addition to collinear divergence, in addition to UV divergences. Okay, because you are dealing with, um, you know, patterns at very, very high energies, and uh, they all, uh, you know, behave as if they are massless. And those massless patterns actually are sensitive to infrared divergences. So you have, uh, you know, soft divergence coming from soft gluons and uh, collinear divergence coming from massless patterns when they become collinear to each other. Okay, all these divergences are regularized using the standard uh, dimensional regularization. Okay, that introduces this parameter epsilon actually. So your calculations at NNLO level contains all uh, results expressed in terms of 
epsilon and they appear as poles. Now all the divergence appear as poles in this. Okay. So to do these integrals actually, you have two types of integrals, one coming from uh, loop integrals. Those integrals are done using integration by parts. Actually. This is a kind of a modern method that we can use, okay, which follows from Gauss theorem. So you can use this to actually evaluate all the integrals. Basically, you can uh, hundreds of thousands of integrals uh, that you en encounter in two loop computations can all be simplified and uh, written in terms of certain, you know, uh, what they call scalar integrals. Okay, the number of integrals that you get by using these identities will be very, very limited and, and level actually. So they are called master integrals. So we use certain, you know, tools to actually reduce all these very complicated looking integrals, large number of integrals to a finite number of integrals. And that reduces our, um, you know, uh, work to, to the manageable, to a manageable level actually. Okay. And these are called IBB reduction, integration by parts reduction. Actually. Finally, after you reduce them to a fewer set of integrals, we need to solve them explicitly actually. There's no way out, you know, except solving them actually. So typically, if you have a three body phase space, you have an integral of this kind. And this project was actually not being done for last 30 years simply because these kind of integrals, if you want to do it explicitly and get a distribution in as a function of z and x, okay, it's highly non trivial actually. So now in last 30 years, there were many, many developments in QCD community to perform, you know, very high precision integrals actually in a very efficient way. Okay. So there's, there was lab development that actually resulted in solving this in three body phase space integral exactly for processes of this kind. In fact, you know, many of these uh, phase space integrals, we can actually convert it into loop integrals by using what they call reverse unitarity. And you can reduce them into some master integrals. Okay, master integrals are also, you don't calculate because these are all complicated uh, two and three loop integrals. So it's not very easy to calculate by just using some Feynman parameterization or Schrodinger parameterization. So we have new methods called differential equation methods. Okay, so you can actually you know recast all the integrals as you know, set of differential equations, and uh, and these differential equations require only boundary conditions in certain kinematic domains, and one can use this you know differential equation methods to solve all these complicated integrals for this project. Okay and reduce them to some set of uh, simple uh, looking uh, integrals, where all I need is this boundary integrals, the rest of them are actually are known, okay? So instead of solving integrals by the standard methods, you solve differential equations, okay? First started couple of differential equations, okay? And this is a very uh, modern method to, to calculate the Feynman integrals. And finally, all Feynman integrals can be expressed in terms of certain path ordered, you know, expressions and this path ordered expressions, if you expand it, will reduce to certain polylogs actually. So this is how you reduce all your master integrals in terms of this. So this is a method that we learned in last 20 years. Okay, there are a lot of lots and lots of developments. Thanks to that development that we can actually solve this, you know, to loop uh, semi-inclusive DIS process actually. And also we need to deal with, you know, two scaling variables simultaneously. And the scaling variables appear as, you know, as a function of uh, epsilon. And we need to also worry about analytical continuation to a physical region and use Feynman prescription to actually analytically continue and, uh, you know, express them in terms of theta functions. And, and after doing that, we need to actually pull out all the divergences which are resulting from collinear and soft. And we use this very sophisticated uh, expansions, you know, it's called plus distributions, okay, to extract out the poles that are resulting from the regions where X and Z goes to one, which are, you know, soft and collinear regions. And those divergences will cancel among uh, various Feynman diagrams. So unless we separate them out, we cannot cancel them. After doing that, we end up with, you know, double distributions actually, because we have two scaling variables, one corresponding to any coming pattern, the other corresponding to the final state pattern. So all that 
uh, we need to worry about. At the end, after you know, reducing them to finite number of integrals, solving them by differential equation methods, and you know, you know, separating out the divergences using these plus distributions, we end up with a nice looking um, result. Okay, and that result is sensitive to again, you know, infinite divergences. Those divergences can be removed only by mass factorization. It's very similar to this UV renormalization. In the last week, uh, I described how this is done for the students who attended the school. Okay, so similar approach one can follow here. You can write down the one that we calculated that are singular in the soft limit and collinear limit. They can be actually mass factorized in a very systematic way, and there is all other proof that exists for such you know, observables. Hence, we can successfully do this mass factorization and extract out this f from this. The f that we get after mass factorization is finite when epsilon goes to zero. So you calculate all these integrals, plug into this, you know, cross section, you know, uh, cross sections, and then you use this formula to extract the finite part. Actually, that is the one which contributes to your observables. Actually, so typically the extraction would look something like this. You write down, you know, this mass factorized results at every order in perturbation theory, and you systematically ex extract this, this f that appear here actually, which are finite. So what we obtain is finally, you know, the quark contribution to, you know, quark, in, you know, contributions to the non-singlet part of the semi-inclusive DIS, okay? And um, of course, we can actually plug them in, um, into the cross-section formula, and we can get predictions for, uh, let's say, K factor. K factor is nothing but, you know, how big your corrections are actually. If it is nothing, the K factor will be one because it's just a ratio of an extra leading order against leading order or next to next leading order against leading order actually. So just a ratio which tells you how big your corrections are actually. So you can actually parameterize uh, your cross section in terms of the K factor and uh, add NLO, NNLO, etc., and see how it is looking like actually. Since you know the data is not very uh, rich, okay, the, the, particularly in uh, the uh, PDFs, the, the fragmentation functions are not so precise, okay. We did not want to use any realistic ones. We also have plots with realistic ones, but we used a sample ones because. Our interest here is not to actually fit anything to anything. We would like to see how big the corrections are, why it is important, okay? And um, it, it, the corrections that we computed will work for any PDFs and uh, fragmentation uh, functions that, that are available in the literature. So just to you know, illustrate how big the you know, corrections are, we have plotted both NLO and NNLO uh, K factors, and you can see that there are differences in uh, K factor. The corrections are not small; they are quite large, and it is important that we need to include them. Actually, number two, these corrections also reduce the scale uncertainties. You might have seen actually in all PDFs uh, predictions, there's a huge error band actually at small x. They are not just purely coming from the fact that you know you have poor data, poor set of data. It's also coming from the fact that, you know, that the uh, fits that use, you know, the fits use actually certain uh, you know, cross-section formula computed in perturbative QCD. And perturbative QCD are sensitive to, you know, the order in which you compute actually. Leading order is highly, you know, unreliable. Next to leading order is little reliable. Next to next to leading order is more reliable and so on and so forth actually. Okay. So this, this bands that you see, it's not only because of some you know, uncertainty in the, in the data, it is also uncertainty coming from the formula that you use to fit this data up, okay? So there could be large uncertainty coming from these predictions, actually. If you use NLO result for a typical you know, set, there's a huge band, and by including the higher order effects, okay, you bring down all this you know, uncertainty resulting from theory, and this uncertainty is actually not too big, actually. Okay, 
So if you add more and more terms, you expect that you know less and less sensitive to this um, the scales and uh, choice of PDFs and so on and so forth. Actually, so in some sense, we can actually uh, resolve this problem of you know theoretical uh, uncertainties by adding more and more terms in the perturbation. That's an exercise that we did. Okay, after completing this work, um, we did this non-singlet part actually, which is the dominant one. Okay. And the subdominant ones are actually several orders smaller, actually. Okay, that's still you know in under you know in in the, in the uh, way. So they, there is also another paper which appeared just you know la, last week when this program was going on. Okay, we we saw this paper actually, which reproduced our results, particularly the part that given here. The subleading ones are given several orders smaller than the leading order ones. Okay, and uh, we are in um, agreement with uh, with them actually in some sense. Okay, so this is another paper that appeared in the literature actually. So there are a couple of pa papers in two months for some reason. Okay, on this particular topic, you know, sort of closing down um, uh, you know, this, this uh, work in this direction. NNLO corrections to QCD which has been pending for the last uh, four decades, I would say. Okay, thanks to EIC, uh, there's a, re a revival of interest in, uh, you know, pedibility community to work on uh, physics at EIC, in particular in the context of calculating uh, the pedibility corrections to observables at uh, EIC. Okay, so this is, uh, this, this, this is the testament, testament of uh, this, um, what you call int revival of interest actually in the community who have been mostly doing LHC physics, you know, QCD means, you know, LHC physics. Now uh, there's a lot of interest in uh, QCD corrections to LHC, you know, TIC physics. Okay, so in, to conclude actually, um, after 40 years, we have now results for semi-inclusive DIS at NNLO level. I would say this is the, you know, most precise result in the context of semi-inclusive. DIS, okay, and we have taken into all channels very nicely, and uh, I have not actually shown the you know impact of these results you know in a big way, because it's done only uh, you know three to four weeks before, and we published it because there are a lot of you know competition along in the community, so we have two results as you can see, so now we will see in few months actually more uh, uh, results in this direction uh, by including resummation and uh, many other aspects and looking at data, in particular the comp compass data. And uh, possibly at some point, uh, you know, we'll also have a study with the EIC data, okay? So this is, uh, this is the conclusion that I would like to bring in. So this is a very, very fresh result after uh, Altarelli and company had, uh, you know, Publish the result on NLO. Thank you. Questions? Uh, um, yeah, thanks a lot for the great talk. It's really nice to see those results now at NLO. Um, I was wondering um, on the slides of your numerical results, what values for Q and X did you choose? Um, in, in this slide, actually, this uh, this slide. Yeah, this, this one, right. And may, maybe a second question is: Did you check um, what did you compare to Werner's approximate results, we, which I think were based on yes, threshold yes, resummation, we, right? How how good were they? Yes, uh, we like compared the actually. Yeah, but you know, SV is just an approximation actually. Right, so right. there is a big difference between uh, SV and the regular part that is coming from all these uh, right. QCD effects. Okay. There are differences actually. Well, there are differences, very, very much different, different from what we can so, so you're saying the threshold approximation is not very it's, good? It is not, uh, I won't say it's bad, but it is not uh, sufficient, actually. Mm -hmm. And maybe if you could comment on the kinematics of this. Then. Ah, this one, actually, this is just, uh, you know, uh, uh, toy exercise, actually. We considered a Q of um, 100, uh, root S is 100 GeV, actually, we considered, you know thinking that EIC at some point will have anti-GEV. So that is our kinematic lecture. And we considered 
again the re uh, region of y, the y, the y which is the leptonic y, uh, between uh, 0 0.2 to 0 0.7 or something like that. And then uh, x value is also very narrow range actually, in the central region, where PDF is very well understood, that region actually. So we, see we were only interested in the z part, so we actually were sort of taking a z and q square for uh, convenience. We have plots for other uh, realistic ones, but this is, you know, sort of first result, so I thought I would give you this. So I was wondering if you plan to release some of this calculation as part of some, like, numerical program, because if someone yes. measures hadron in experiment and want to invert to go to patterns, then your calculation should uh, tell us a better template to comparison sure. from hadron to parton level compared to the previous computation. Yes, yes, yes. We have actually a code. Uh, I mean, we have okay. a code in our with us actually. We have not published the code up, okay, of course. Once we actually you know compare it with the compass data which is available, okay, and publish it, we will actually release the code actually. Okay. Thank Thank you. Code. Uh, any other questions? So here, uh, concerning this slide, I also had a couple of questions. One is I didn't understand what's the difference between the SV uh, lines and the other, and the, so the dashed line and the solid line. Oh, the SV is actually, um, if you look at uh, your uh, cross section, okay, you have uh, distributions of this kind, delta one minus X and curly D, which is the plus distribution, mm -hmm. okay? And you also have a regular terms, which are not distributions, regular terms like some polynomial in Z or you know, some polylogs, which are um, well behaved actually, unlike these quantities. These are actually distributions in, you know, only within an integral actually, they make sense, okay, not as a separate functions. So you collectively call such, you know, distributions soft plus virtual because they come from soft. Say it again. Soft plus virtual. The, the delta function comes from virtual part. Both delta as well as this distributions come from the, you know, real emissions when they become soft. Gluons become soft or collinear actually. So they're called soft plus virtual contributions. So there are systematic way using this, what they call Sudakov resummation to extract out these quantities. And they are actually universal in some sense. So if you know from one particular process, which are known, you can actually transport it by some simple, simple, you know, change of variables actually. So they are, they are connected actually. Uh, soft distributions from, uh, say, let's say, uh, trillion, we can actually transport to soft distributions for the semi-inclusive because both have got uh, two distributions. Trillion contains QQ bar or uh, QG or QG. Here you have a PDF and fragmentation. Okay, they are in some sense uh, connected actually. Okay, so, so in those plots, you were showing the effect of only those uh, terms uh, compared to the full uh, yeah, exactly. calculation. So I just wanted to compare how it compares with SV to answer this question actually for uh, test functions. The uh, dotted, uh, you know, dashed lines are actually coming from this approximation, soft plus virtual approximation, where I drop all the regular terms. If I include the regular terms, that's, you, you get a, difference of this kind of thing. And so maybe, maybe I'm repeating a, a question again, but let's just to just clarify. So what's, I, what's the relation between the full calculation and the, uh, these approximate calculations that have uh, been performed a couple of years ago, right? Am I, am I oh, right? No. There, there were some approximate results yeah. a couple of years ago, I think. By the Florian and company. Exactly. Actually. Yeah. They What's actually, the relation between? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, they actually those those computation uh, were only at uh, you know what do you call actually incomplete computation actually because they tried s certain parts of the calculation you know full processes where they could do the integrals they and they claim that they are dominant actually but I think it's very it, they are not 
complete in some sense. No, yeah, and they, they are also they, not they dominant. Admit, uh, they admit that it's not complete. But yeah, can you yeah. can you check what's the difference? Well, yeah, the one can do that actually. One can. We did that checks actually, but they are not complete. They are not complete also not, they are not dominant either actually. yeah that's the point i mean they are not complete we we knew it but uh, they are, are not they dominant, dominant or the no, difference they are, is already they are not, big they're not really dominant interesting actually. if i'm allowed a very short another short question uh, so also in, in the, the the lowest plot i don't yeah. understand very much why there are nodes in this uh, uh, scale uh, dependence, why lay, let's say at uh, Z, oh. 0 0.6, there is okay. no it's, dependence. It's, it's, it's because, see, the thing is actually the uh, evolution is determined by uh, logs, and the, the coefficient of logs are controlled by what they call splitting functions. Okay? There are two types of splitting functions. One correspond to PDFs, the other one cor uh, corresponds to um, fragmentation functions. So these uh, coefficients are controlled by these, you know, splitting functions, and it may so happen at certain values of z, the you know the logs will be highly suppressed by the you know the splitting functions. For example, the splitting function vanishes closely related to 0.5. Some you know conspiracy. Okay, this can happen actually. So it's not accident. It is. Um, it, the, the the scaling is it's whatever the violation of the scale is actually controlled by the p you know splitting functions alternately parisian splitting functions and that's why this shape uh, depends on the value of z otherwise it will be constant with respect to with respect to z uh, we don't see any other questions let's thanks ravindran thank you